what I want to share with you is some thoughts about the time we live in and what's next. How this time, which for many of us is the most incredible one, seems dark. Why is it that in a period when there's never been more rapid progress, is there such an anxiety? Why is it that we feel that the world is falling apart when we've never been more connected? Why in this period of miracles, such as those that Asha shared with us, do we feel that it's the end of time? And the reason I want to share with you is that we are managing this extremely badly, that we don't understand how unique this moment is, and that we are unable to capture the essence of what's going on. So this is the slowest moment you'll know for the rest of your lives. The speed of change is accelerating. And it's accelerating because of this connectivity, because of our capacity to join dots around the world, because of our capacity to release brain power around the world. We move from a world where only about 200 million people were connected 30 years ago to a world of 6.5 billion new connected people. Four and a half billion more literate people in the world over this period of time. Average life expectancy improving by 20 years over this period of time. And it's that miracle of this release of brain power, of collective intelligence of humanity, which means that change is accelerating, that every day there are more and more ideas and there's more potential. Potential to solve cancer, Alzheimer's, dementia, sort of things I worry about. Potential to create a carbon-free global economy to address climate change. Potential to do many things. But will we do it, is the question. Are we able to harness this energy, which is so unique and so special of our time? And in thinking about this, I've been trying to think about what period in history can give us a lesson. Not because history repeats itself, it does not, but it rhymes. There are clues from history that allow us to make sense, to gain perspective. And the particular period which I'm struck by is the one that I believe gives us a sense of why is it at this time people feel so angry? Why at a time of hyperconnectivity do people want rising nationalism, protectionism, and to set back the clock? It'll be 30 years in November since the Berlin Wall came down, and it's 30 years since the World Wide Web was developed. So it's a good moment to pause and reflect, where will we be in 30 years' time as we approach 2050? We're in an age of discovery. We're in a Renaissance moment. This is the second Renaissance, the great flowering that was associated 500 years ago, taking Europe from being one of the most backward places on the planet to by far the most advanced. And in my new book, what I try and explore is how did this happen? Why was Florence taken from a backwater to the place that everyone in the world wanted to be? It was the Silicon Valley of the late 1400s driven by an information revolution. Then the Gutenberg Press developed not far from here. A press that created an information revolution and took ideas from being simply monopolized by preachers, handwritten manuscripts in Latin, in monasteries, to things that ordinary people could access, and they did. And that's why we had the Da Vinci's, the Michelangelo's, the Copernicus's, and others. That totally changed the world. They took the Earth from being the center of the universe to simply one place, orbiting around a sun, around other suns. It took flat Earth to round Earth. It led to circumnavigation and, of course, the discovery of the Americas and the rest of the world. That was globalization 1.0. And that globalization 1.0, like our globalization 2.0 of the 1990s and subsequently, is about walls coming down. It's about places that were disconnected, connected, and creating a common humanity. It was a process that led to leaps 
in understanding, and that's why 500 years later, we still celebrate the Renaissance and know that it was a period when genius erupted. And genius is erupting today. And it's erupting in all dimensions. I'm a South African, I was born there, I left, I thought I would never go back to my country, and I was living in Paris when the wall came down. Two months after it came down, Nelson Mandela was released from prison. He came to Paris a bit later. He asked me to be his economic advisor, and I went back to do that and to run the state bank. And what I realized in that is that these disconnected things connect in new ways. 65 countries became democratic within a period of seven years. That's what these systemic changes do. They lead to tides of change around the world, and they tides of change which bring progress, an opportunity. And of course, the other thing that happened at the same time was the development of the World Wide Web. And that has created this platform for shared knowledge on which we are all building. The Hubble's telescope and many other things followed soon after. And so this technology has created opportunities around the world for people to learn in new ways and for the first time in human history for us to be able to tap the full potential of humanity in creating ideas, in solving problems, and exploring how to advance. Because the walls have come down, there are two billion more people in the world. Ideas are traveling that are leading people to live longer, healthier lives. Simple ideas, like smoking kills you, wearing a safety belt saves your life, complicated ideas, like those embedded in vaccines, cures for cancer. So 20-year average improvement in life expectancy. Why do people feel so gloomy when this progress has been more rapid than at any moment in history? And the reason is because of some of the unintended consequences. The ships that went to the New World to discover the Americas led to the spread of diseases that killed most Native Americans. They did not like globalization. It brought them blood, tears, and death. And of course, the ships that came back spread diseases that killed millions of Europeans, syphilis and others, diseases. The spreading of systemic risks through early globalization was the first great lesson of that period. The second was that the ships that came back with gold and spices and furs didn't benefit ordinary people. Inequality grew rapidly, and with that, People like this guy, Savonarola, in Florence, could say, progress is bad, progress is unethical, progress leads to the scribes being put out of work, and he created a jihadist republic in Florence that displaced the Medicis. You know about the bonfire of the vanities, the burning of books, the destruction of progress, and of course the inquisitions, the hounding out of all diversity. Florence had been the most diverse place. Muslims, Jews, Christians, co-inventing, gays, celebrating. They were hung from the trees after that guy took over. This was the end of diversity in Europe. Jews, Muslims hounded out of Europe. And what we learn from that is if you don't manage progress, people don't feel comfortable with it. So how do we take this anti-expert, anti-science reaction to the Renaissance and turn it into something which is meaningful in our time? How do we make sure that the web does not spread terror and bad ideas, but only good ideas? How do we ensure that these technologies are a force for good and get over the simple naiveties of Silicon Valley that technology brings progress? It brings progress, but it brings destruction too. It brings anger. We estimate in Oxford that maybe half of US jobs will be lost through machine intelligence and AI over the next 20 years. About 40% of German jobs, about 40% of UK jobs, about 60% of Chinese jobs are vulnerable. If people feel anxious, don't blame them. What we've seen with the financial crisis is a spectacular failure to manage globalization. I believe we would not have Trump in the White House. We would not have Brexit in the UK. We would not have the extreme parties across Europe at the scale they are if it had not been for the financial crisis. This was a vivid, catastrophic demonstration of a failure to manage joined up systems and technological change. 
Credit derivatives were not understood. The super spreading of the risks through nodes and networks was not understood. The best minds in the best institutions like the Treasury, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, the IMF, over 20,000 PhD economists didn't know that when you pulled the plug on Lehman Brothers, the global financial system would collapse. And you wonder why people don't trust experts and authorities. We let them down, we let them down dismally, and we have to say that we didn't manage globalization effectively. Inequality is growing because when change happens more rapidly, people get left behind more quickly. And when a crisis comes like the financial crisis, it exacerbates that. So this dismal failure of globalization is something we need to learn from. If we to sustain it, if we to create open societies, if we are to progress with technology, we need to become much more effective and much more inclusive. We need to learn that unless we are able to increase a sustainable and inclusive globalization, it will fall apart as the Renaissance did. While the walls have come down between societies, within societies, the walls are going up everywhere. And this process is within countries far from globalization lending to a world which is flat or the death of distance or the end of ideology. You may remember those iconic books. It's the opposite. The world has never been more mountainous. Place has never mattered more. And globalization makes it matter more. The dynamic cities are pulling away from the hinterlands. It's all very well to be in Silicon Valley or in Munich or London and say, this is working nicely. Record low unemployment, record high incomes, but go a few hundred kilometers out of it and see what's happening. And those are the people, and we've mapped this, we've done the analysis, that are rejecting globalization because they cannot afford to live in the dynamic cities. They don't have the skills to live in the dynamic cities. The spreading of risks like the financial crisis is a broader problem. The super spreaders of the goods of globalization like major airport hubs are also the super spreaders of the bads. We've modeled the spread of swine flu, for example, and shown it exactly replicates airline traffic. And so managing interconnectivity, managing nodes and networks, and ensuring that our systems have integrity so that when we switch on, we're not becoming more vulnerable is absolutely essential to this process. Ensuring that we have a future with jobs, decent jobs. And this is not UBI, giving people money to stay at home, which is a recipe for disaster, universal basic income. What you get from that is what you get in the Midwest of the US, which is towns characterized by social delusions, disillusionment, supporters of protectionism and nationalism, drug pandemics, suicide, and all sorts of other signs of social dislocation. We have to pe give people a meaningful future, a future with jobs, with opportunities, where they can say that this progress is a progress which is benefiting them and future generations. And if the problems are acute in the rich countries, they're even more acute in developing countries which are yet to climb the development ladder. When you take away anything that's routine and rules-based, repetitive, manufacturing jobs, service jobs in call centers, in back offices, the question is, what is the path to development? How do you progress through to become an advanced society? How do you raise your incomes in these environments? And these are fundamental questions which we need to address collectively. As population pressures increase, as the number of people urbanizing increases and the pressures on land, on energy systems intensify, how we manage the collective commons, how we ensure that the spillovers of our choices are sustainable is of course equally critical. And we see it graphically with the fisheries, we see it graphically with climate change and in many other areas. And the irony of the great success of the free market and globalization is that we need to accept that with our freedom is going to come more restraint. We can no longer have sushi whenever we want because we're destroying the tuna. We can no longer use any energy system we want because we're destroying the climate. We can no longer make our free choices based on money alone, no matter how much money we have. And so this recognition 
that we're in it together, that we have a collective responsibility for the planet and for each other, is the next stage, I believe, of this renaissance. And without this next stage, without recognizing that market solutions will not create a sustainable thing, but it's going to be a balance between markets and regulations. It's going to be a society in which we accept that it's fine if everyone does something that's sustainable. If 200 million people take antibiotics, it's fine. If 2 billion people take them, none of them will work. No matter how much a rhino horn is worth, the rhino will not reproduce more when their horns are worth more. Nature and ecological systems don't respond to price signals. And so thinking about this trade-off between individual choice and collective outcomes becomes more and more acute. We live in a society in which each choice we make increasingly spills over in new ways. We're not simply connected, we entangled. And that's why trying to isolate ourselves is so profoundly misguided. There is no wall high enough that will keep out climate change or a pandemic or any of the other great challenges that we face. But what these high walls will keep out is the people, the ideas, the technologies, and most of all, the cooperation we need in order to address these collective challenges. Despite all of this, and what might sound like a rather gloomy prognosis, I'm incredibly optimistic. And the reason is because we move from a world in which we simply relied on old white men to solve problems to a world where we can draw on the whole talent pool, where we can ensure that the collective energy and genius of humanity is released in new ways. I'm optimistic because I see in the labs of the Oxford Martin School, like this Oxford Martin Stem Cell Lab, but many others and around the world, I see things happening, like we've just heard from Osh, which inspire us about the capability to tackle problems on energy, on health, and in other areas. That is more rapid than ever in history, too. And I'm inspired because I've seen technologies that make a fundamental difference to our capability to overcome disabilities, to tackle global problems, and to think in new ways. So technology can be, and of course should be, an immense force for good. But how we do this requires also that we develop a collective ability to understand the spillovers, that we realize that this capacity to think, to empathize, to see, to feel across the planet is leading to something which humanity hasn't had since we moved out of our collective home in East Africa about 200,000 years ago. And that's the capacity to really know what's going on, to understand that what hurts one person hurts us all, to understand that what hurts the planet hurts us all. I'm inspired too by the capacity of new technologies to create new options. People talk a lot about how social media is giving strength to the extreme right and the extreme left, and of course we need to worry about that and fake news and the use by others of these technologies. But we can be inspired too by the capacity of centrists to use this new technology. No one had heard of President Macron two years before he came president. And on a pro-globalization message, which is not always popular in France, he was able to mobilize support out of nowhere, disintermediating as the ultra-right and left had, the old authorities, but in new ways. I'm inspired too by the Paris Climate Agreement and the ability of people for the first time in history to use science as the basis of collective decision making. There are many reasons for hope. There are many reasons to be positive. And as we think about this extraordinary moment in human history, we need to recognize that we are at crossroads. This could be the best century ever because we overcome the challenges that we faced for time immemorial, poverty, disease, and many others, living on a sustainable planet. Or it could be a dystopian one. Indeed, it could be the final century for humanity. The choice is ours, and if we're able to manage that, we'll be able to rock on to a very, very happy old age. Thank you very much. <laughs>